Yeah, I'm happy to introduce Len. I, I actually also don't know quite how to pronounce it. <laughs> but yeah, so Len uh, did his uh, undergraduate degree and master's at the Technical University of Freiburg. Uh, and in his master's thesis, he he worked on uh, Fermi Loden self interaction correction and the, the application uh, to the DFT functionals. Uh, and then he went away for a couple of years and worked as a software developer. Uh, and then uh, in I think, November last year, he joined uh, the Centre for Advanced Systems Understanding, which is part of the uh, HZDR, uh, as a PhD student working for Attila Kangi. Uh, and uh, Lens is kind of focuses on uh, developing um, essentially approaches using machine learning to, to speed up uh, the application of DFT to finite temperatures in the warm dust matter regime. Uh, and that's what he's going to be talking about today. So, yeah, I'll hand over to Lens now. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. My name is introduced Lens, and I'm going to talk about DFT surrogate modeling with the materials learning algorithm package and approaching that from the theoretical background. So, MANA, the materials learning algorithms, is a software package for building machine learning, a machine learning workflow for building surrogate models for DFT that is being developed here at the Center for Advanced Systems Understanding, which is part of the Hamilton Centrum, and then the Sandia National Labs and the Oak Ridge National Lab. And before I go into detail about the theoretical side of things for MALA, I want to give a short motivation on why we do that. So the overall Goal here is to do um, build surrogate models for warm dense matter. So we're interested in this warm dense matter regime, which ranges roughly uh, from 10 to the power of 3 to 10 to the power of 8 kelvins, and mass densities several orders of magnitude above atmospheric density. That means that the Wigner size radius and the reduced temperature become close to unity. So when expressed in energy units, the temperature is around the same magnitude as the Fermi energy. And these warm, this warm dense matter regime occurs naturally in astrophysical objects, and their understanding is one of the reasons why we're interested in that. But this research is also related to um, things like inertial confinement fusion and nuclear stewardship, where the understanding of warm dense matter is also important. And warm dense matter lies between sort of lies between the classical plasmas and what we're used to normally from condensed matter. And we cannot really use the classical plasma physical approach and the calculation methods there. We have to use quantum mechanical descriptions to be accurate, but they come with additional costs in this regime. And so we're interested in modeling these materials across several length and time scales to be both accurate in the microscopic scale, but also be able to apply it to larger scales. And of, of course, the tool of choice for that would be uh, usually DFT-MD, so to perform DFT calculations to get atomic forces and then propagate them with classical mechanical molecular dynamics. And the problem is that the cost of the underlying DFT calculation becomes prohibitive, both due to the scales and due to the fact that we're working with high temperatures, for which we have to include a lot of orbitals because we have a lot of excited states. Um, and so the idea here is to build machine learning surrogate models that perform essentially the same mapping as the DFT calculation would perform from, uh, for example, atomic configurations to forces or energies, but much faster because they are done by this machine learning surrogate model. And a range of machine learning techniques could be used to build such a model that is trained on simulation data. And in MALA, we are using neural networks to do that. Um, to generate the training data, or yeah, the underlying simulation framework is finite temperature DFT. So we have, want to describe a system of NI ions and NI electrons at positions R capital underscore and R underscore within the grand canonical ensemble, where the Hamiltonian in this ensemble is the 
regular bottom Oppenheimer Hamiltonian. So we neglect the kinetic energies of the ions and the ion ion interaction. And then the canonical operator is evaluated with density matrices. Um, this results in a DFT framework similar to ground state Kuchan density functional theory. We have uh, Kuchan equations and we can calculate the density from the Kuchan wave functions. Um, the difference is now that we have a temperature dependence in the Kuchan eigenvalues and the Kuchan potential. Um, and the exchange correlation energy. Except for that, this all looks pretty much uh, similar to um, Koncham, Grunze Koncham DFT. We also have to include the electronic entropy of the non-interacting Koncham system into the total energy functional. And the fermi dirac distribution is needed to calculate the density from the orbitals. And which this, with this framework, then the next question becomes, which mapping such a DFT surrogate should perform? Machine learning in this context is just an universal approximator or some sort of or tool to perform this mapping. But the question is, what kind of mapping do we want to learn? And the most intuitive approach probably is to just learn the quantities we're eventually interested in. That is usually the forces or the total energies. Um, from the atomic positions. And that can be done. It can be done quite successfully. There are a lot of approaches to do that. One example that I've put here is just a deep MD. Um, the problem is that we are, one, restricted to only learning the energy itself. Um, and two, that there have been investigations that suggest that this can become quite costly. The training can be uh, improved drastically by a learning intermediate quantity that holds some electronic structure information and then performing post-processing on such a quantity. One example is given here from a publication where the authors were interested in uh, where they used machine learning to predict the density of states and then calculated several quantities from this density of states. So the um, Fermi energy, the value of the density of states at the Fermi energy, the band energy, and, and the distribution of excitations. And they used both several machine learning models to learn the DOS and then post-process it. This is here in blue, orange, and green, but also directly learn these quantities. This is the red arrow bar here. And with the exception of the um, principal component decomposition method in orange, which did not perform well, in general, the performance of First, learning the DOS with some machine learning model and then calculating it performs better than directly learning that quantity. And in turn, that can be also interpreted that a smaller amount of training data could be used to achieve comparable accuracy. So when then taking that into account, then the next logical step would be to learn the density um, and then use density function theory to post-process this density that is learned from the atomic positions. And the problem one comes here, uh, the problem that occurs here is that everything is a function of the density and density function in theory, except for the things that practically are not. So usually in Kuncham density functional theory, the kinetic energy and the electronic entropy are only implicitly functionals of the density, but explicitly functionals of the Kuncham wave functions. Um, and the eigenvalues, so in the case of the electronic entropy, the equation, uh, the definition is given here, and this is dependent on the values of the Fermi Dirac distribution at the eigenvalues. And for the kinetic energy, this is the familiar functional form. And this, of course, can be circumvented. One could train another machine learning model or calculate it via orbital free DFT. Um, the latter holds the problem that orbital free DFT is usually not as accurate as Koncham DFT. And the former, of course, was a problem that now we have to train two machine learning models with all the inherent problems of training such a machine learning model. Um, now we have to address it in two different maps. And therefore, the idea behind Mala is to 
use an even different quantity as an intermediate quantity that is directly outputted from a machine learning workflow that holds more information per grid point than electronic density, so to say, in order to enable us to analytically evaluate, for example, the total energy. What I mean by information is just that if we think of the density as a vector on, um, on the, uh, in the real space, and of course, for each point in space, we have one value, the value of the density. We want to think of a different dimension, so to speak, for example, the energy where the, um, on which the DOS is defined. Um, and that leads to the local density of states, the LDOS, as a spatially and energy resolved target quantity that is used in MANA. So um, at each point in, in space, the local density of states holds a vector on the energy grid that uh, we have to define when calculating the local density of states. The local density of states is defined, excuse me, via the Koncham eigenvalues and wave functions. So um, it's given here with the Dirac distribution. Since we're interested in periodic systems, we have to uh, perform an integration over the Briong zone. And in practice, this then reduces, of course, to a summation over the finite amount of, or the finite grid of K points that we choose. One technical aspect that is uh, worthy of note here is that we cannot explicitly uh, represent the direct distribution in, an, in a uh, software. So we have to approximate it somehow. This is what is meant here by the tilde the symbol over the delta. Um, and practically, this is done by a Gaussian. And this is important because it, in, of course, introduces some error into the LDOS that we have to um, take into account. And the nice thing about the LDOS is that it's connected to the density and the density of states via the equations given here. So we're performing an integration over the real space grid. And at the LDOS, we get the density of states and we're performing an integration over the energy grid with the Fermi Rock distribution, we get the density. And um, therefore, Lens, the. Lens, yeah, just sorry. really quick, um, we're not able to see the very bottom of your slides. Can you just click hide on that dialog box? Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't. I didn't realize you saw that too. Yeah, of course. Oh yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I, I yeah. Um, if you just click hide, I, yeah, okay, perfect. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So then again, so this is the density, and if you integrate the log of the LDOS, you get the density. Um, and since most of the terms in the Koncham total energy function are already dependent on the density, the only thing we now have to do is to represent the terms that are not in terms of the DOS. And if we can do that, then we can um, evaluate everything with the LDOS. And then the first part of that is the kinetic energy that we have to reformulate in terms of the DOS. And we do that by using the band energy, uh, which is defined as the sum over the eigenvalues times the Fermi Dirac distribution, um, or the values of the Fermi Dirac distribution at these eigenvalues, or via an integral over the DOS times the energy times the Fermi Dirac distribution. Um, that this then can be reformulated by uh, using the expressions for the Koncham equations into such a form, including the um, operator side of the Koncham equations, which then again reduces quite neatly to the kinetic energy of the non-interacting system plus the interaction of the density with the Koncham potential. And um, uh, yeah, with this, we can express the kinetic energy as um, the band energy in terms of the DOS minus this interaction. And the Koncham potential can be expressed as uh, the sum of the ionic potential, the Hartree potential, and the exchange correlation potential. Um, and through some reformulation, we can express the total energy in terms of the band energy minus the entropy minus the Hartree energy and plus the exchange collation energy and then the interaction of the exchange collation potential with the density. The entropy can uh, also be given directly in terms of the DOS. 
Um, the entropy is usually of course defined uh, as given here. I've also shown that earlier over the values of the Fermi Dirac distribution. And this can easily be reformulated in terms of the dots with such an integral. And with this, we have the total energy as a functional of the L dots. Um, there are two uh, dots dependent terms and the rest are density dependent terms. So we have to integrate the L dots to dots and density respectively. Here's some um, numerical proof, proof I've calculated uh, for that. Um, these, cal these calculations were done on a beryllium cell of 128 atoms in the liquid phase at melting temperature. Um, and what I've done here is uh, for 30 different atomic configurations, I calculated uh, first the total energy with DFT, just regular DFT calculation, and then use these DFT calculations to calculate the density, DOS, and LDOS, and then use these quantities, one on the left side, the density and DOS directly, and on the right side, um, the LDOS and the density and DOS derived therefrom to calculate the total energies and calculate the errors to the DFT outputs. And the errors are given here in, in percent. And you can see that for both cases, the error ranges below 0.1%. And the error is slightly larger, just looking at the average um, on the left-hand side for uh, density and DOS, but more consistent, which is important for um, uh, for DFT calculations, because we're often not interested directly in the value of the total energy itself. What is often more interesting are differences in total energies. And so a consistent error is more important here, but even um, having, having said that, the errors are generally quite small. So um, we can use this framework to evaluate the total energies with some error that is introduced by discretization performed uh, by some discretization error that is uh, just occurs when calculating the LDOS or the DOS. Uh, one thing that I haven't talked about yet, but that might have, some of you might have noticed is the Fermi energy. The evaluation of the LDOS is based on the Fermi Dirac distribution and multiple um, steps of the, the calculation. And that is, of course, dependent on the Fermi energy. We have to choose some Fermi energy to define the distribution. That's easy when we do a DFT calculation and then just want to test out to value the total energy differently. But for predicted values that occur during the actual machine learning inference, which is what we're interested in, there's no Fermi energy given. And what we're doing here is calculating a self-consistent Fermi energy. That is a Fermi energy that is restricted to reproduce the exact number of electrons when um, evaluating this the integral on the right. And we then shift the Fermi energy, which um, leads to corrected number, uh, leads to the correct number of electrons, of course, eventually, and then also to improve band energies and total energies. And another thing I haven't touched yet is uh, the forces. As I've mentioned earlier, we're interested in DFT and D, so of course the forces are even more important than the total energies. And currently forces are not implemented in MALA. That's currently work in progress. Um, there are two ways to do that with our current framework. And one is to evaluate it via partial derivatives and the chain rule. This um, draws from the fact that we're using neural networks because neural network libraries usually come with functionalities to perform automatic differentiation and backpropagate a gradient uh, calculated for the outputs of a neural network all the way to the input. Um, and that, to do that also very efficiently, so we don't have to do that ourselves. Um, before I show the equation for that, um, the local environments in our machine learning workflow, so the input of our neural networks are represented by descriptors um, uh, with the with a, a capital B. And with this, we can express the forces in our framework. We calculate the, um, or we want to calculate the derivative of the total energy with respect to the atomic positions um, as a product of the 
derivative of the total energy with respect to the LDOS, the LDOS with respect to our descriptors, and the descriptors uh, with respect to the atomic positions. And the middle part of this equation is what we can get directly from the neural network by using the automatic differentiation functionalities from um, the neural network library that we're using. The first and the last expression have to be evaluated analytically, and that's currently the work in progress. Another possible way to do that that I'm uh, mostly working on at the moment is or are the Hellman Feynman process, so calculating the forces via the Hellman Feynman theorem, which in theory leads to a very nice expression that is only dependent on the positions of the ions and the density, plus some technical corrections. This is especially important when um, in a theoretical chemistry, um, theoretical chemistry codes where atomic centered base sets are used, and so the density is not independent from the positions of the atoms because the representation of the basis functions depends on that. That's not directly a constraint that we have because we're using mostly periodic codes. They're just plane wave basis sets. Um, but yet there are some technical issues with the implementation that I'm currently working on. Yeah, and um, with that, I wanna go a little bit more into detail about the framework itself and the results. So um, MALA is a framework for learning the local density of states from atomic positions and then post-processing it into quantities of interest. Currently, only the total energy, and in the future, hopefully, a wider array of um, output quantities. To do that, we perform DFT MD calculations using standard DFD codes, such as VASP or Quantum Espresso, to generate a training set of positions perform DFT calculations on those to get the LDOS and use the LAMS code to calculate snap descriptors. And for those of you familiar with snap descriptors, we use them a little bit differently here. Usually they are, they fingerprint an atomic configuration. What we do here is we fingerprint um, a grid point. So we calculate a snap descriptor for each grid point. That is because the neural networks we then build with PyTorch also operate on such a per grid point basis, meaning that each grid point we perform a network pass. So we input a snap vector and get the value of the local density of states at this um, grid point out of it. And um, then we can do that also in inference mode, get the LDOS, um, get with that the DOS and the density, and then post process that into whatever um, we're interested in. Um, the idea of doing it on a per grid point basis is that it could enable us to be um, to do an easier transfer between uh, simulation cells of different sizes, given that the local environments would be uh, would follow the same mapping. The concrete size of an of a simulation cell is not uh, as important. Whether or not that's possible is currently also. Um, what I'm investigating. And MALA is soon to be released, uh, soon to be released as open source on GitHub after some licensing um, issues have been addressed. And it's a joint development between the Center for Advanced Systems Understanding here in Germany and Sandia National Labs and Oak Ridge National Lab, as I've mentioned earlier. Um, and that's this I want to get to some results. So um, the first applications of MALA to reactor aluminum, both at the melting point and room temperature. We um, published these investigations uh, recently in uh, FISR FB. And the um, chief result here is a hybrid model for aluminum at the melting point that is accurate both in the liquid and the solid phase. So, uh, the model that performed best, we tried different uh, hybrid models, was uh, one that consisted or trained on six liquid and six solid configurations. Liquid configuration, there's uh, such as the ones on the left and uh, solid as the ones on the right. And the here is uh, the results from the direct performance of the bad energy and the total energy. 
Uh, left of the red line are the liquid snapshots and right the solid snapshots. And you can see that the machine learning hybrid model quite accurately reproduces the values of the DFT targets. The overall accuracy is within chemical accuracy with uh, 13 and 30 respectively, milli electron volts per atom for liquid and solid. Um, uh, configurations, it's slightly better on the liquid side than on the solid side here. Of course, this uh, these uh, accurate energy values also have to translate to accurate predictions in terms of the density and the density of states. So um, here is uh, the density in the left for liquid, on the right for a solid snapshot, uh, both the, the predicted versus the target values. We see more variance in the liquid case, which is uh, due to the fact that there exists a wider variety of um, local environments for the liquid case than the solid case. But generally, the prediction of the ALDOS is able to recover also the density, as one would expect from the energy values. The same uh, holds for the density. Again, given for the liquid and the solid case here, the prediction in black and the uh, red and the target in black. And again, here the errors are quite small. Um, what's also of note here is that the, that for the solid configurations, we see uh, still some some uh, von Hove singularities, or they are still more pronounced, at least than for the um, liquid case, in which they are almost vanished. So that makes, of course, learning the, the DOS itself, although the DOS itself is easier here in the liquid case. Um, we also trained model for aluminum at room temperature. The results are given here. This is, of course, then all in the solid phase because there is no liquid phase. And um, the arrows are even smaller than for the, for the melting point, which makes intuitive sense since we only are learning on one, on one phase and the configurations are, can be expected to be quite similar to each other. And with that, also the local environment. And what, we've only used one configuration training set here. So um, this is the zero snapshot here, for which, as we can see, the prediction is um, almost exact. Um, and then for the others, the other uh, test snapshots, the error is also quite small. Um, this is, of course, as we would expect, that it's easier for the, for the lower temperatures than for the higher temperatures. So, of course, one of our next goals is to go to higher temperatures and to other materials. So, to extend MALA to new materials and go more into the temperature range that, that we're interested in. Melting point of aluminum is still rather cold for the warm, dense MALA regime. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. I think I finished a little bit early. Um, but if there are any questions, please feel free to ask.